Hello, I am Professor Kino, and welcome to my office of Cinematic Antiquity. Today we will be talking about... The Stephen King film adaptation Renaissance is still trucking away at full speed. Doctor Sleep is the fourth film adaptation of one of King's work to have come out this year, following Pet Cemetery, It Chapter 2, and In the Tall Grass, and was also, in my honest opinion, the most challenging. And by this I don't mean on a technical standpoint or narrative standpoint necessarily, but on the mere fact that in making this film, it needed to adapt, in a sense, two different works. The first of these is, of course, the Stephen King book titled Doctor Sleep itself, the sequel to the 1977 King masterpiece The Shining that had been gestating in King's mind for 36 years before being published in 2013. And the second work that needed to be adapted was Stanley Kubrick's 1980 adaptation of The Shining, a film that King openly detests due to the narrative liberties that it takes of his book. In fact, King hates Kubrick's Shining so much that he actually went out and made his own adaptation of it with a three-episode miniseries in 1997. Despite this effort, though, Kubrick's Shining is still considered by most everyone to be the superior of the two screen adaptations, and is the one that most everyone thinks of when contemplating The Shining. So to put this simply, when director Mike Flanagan came in to direct Dr. Sleep, he had a difficult task ahead of him. He needed to adapt King's book to appease King and his plethora of fans, in addition to creating a sequel to Kubrick's film in such a way so as to appease his plethora of fans. I mean, like, how do you even do that? The two groups are almost polar opposites. How do you make something that appeals to both? But I had faith in Mike Flanagan because of his previous creative, smart, and spooky work on Oculus, Hush, Ouija, Origin of Evil, Gerald's Game, which just so happens to be another King adaptation, and the spectacular Haunting of Hill House. So, did he pull off the seemingly impossible task of adapting Doctor Sleep to the silver screen, or is the result just a snooze fest? Premise after spending 40 years trying to escape the trauma caused by his father's axe-murdering fiasco at the Overlook Hotel, as well as his complicated telepathic power known simply as The Shining, Danny Torrance finally finds some semblance of peace by starting a new life far away from his complicated history. But after he comes into contact with a young girl, Abra, who shares his ability to shine, and together they discover a group of humanoid beings known as the True Knot, led by the chilling Rose the Hat, who hunt people with the ability to shine in order to feed off of their essence, Danny is forced to confront the past he has been trying to distance himself from in order to save Abra from being devoured by the True Knot. Writing I touched on the complications with writing this film in the intro, but I want to dive deeper here, because despite the hardships that came with writing Dr. Sleep, Mike Flanagan was fully on board. In an interview with The Daily Beast, he said he was excited, although effing terrified, to take on the challenge, because being a fan of both The Shining book and film, as well as the Dr. Sleep book, Flanagan thought that directing Dr. Sleep would be the perfect opportunity to honor and celebrate all three works. And so, slight spoiler here, Flanagan said that one of the first decisions he made was to adapt the Doctor Sleep book the way it was written until the third act. For those that don't know, in The Shining book, the Overlook Hotel burns down at the end, and in the Doctor Sleep book, there was a final confrontation that occurs on the grounds where the Overlook once stood. However, in Kubrick's Shining film, the Overlook doesn't burn down. So Flanagan wanted to keep the final confrontation in his Doctor Sleep film more or less the same as it is in the book, but feature it at the Overlook Hotel instead, in order to honor both King's and Kubrick's creative minds. Now, this idea was initially rejected by King, who Flanagan pitched the idea to almost immediately, for fairly obvious reasons. But after some more talks, King eventually came around to the concept, and production on Doctor Sleep began. And the final film feels very much like what Flanagan was aiming for. The first two acts, despite some small references to the events of The Shining in the very beginning, feel like a story that is separated from The Shining, whereas The Shining film was about at its core the vicious shattering of a family's ties to each other within a very haunting and claustrophobic environment, Dr. Sleep tackles the trauma caused by that breakup on the family's child well into his adult life by using a more open setting that showcases how expansive the trauma is, i.e. to show that the damage isn't relegated to a singular place, but instead present in every aspect of life. However, Dr. Sleep isn't all depressing because it is also about the journey out of this deep-seated trauma, through confronting it directly and conquering it. Consequently, because of this difference, by the end of Dr. Sleep, It and The Shining feel like two vastly different films, or stories if you are coming into this film off the back of The Shining book. 
But despite this, they still feel like two halves of one complete narrative, one that follows the formulation of someone's trauma and the journey through it. And that's fantastic, because due to this, the two films never feel forced together in any way. The connection feels very natural, and this is in part due to Dr. Sleep focusing on the small moments and not relying on homages and fan service, at least until the third act, to relate itself to The Shining. Flanagan spends time developing Danny as an adult, showcasing his trauma and revealing what the shiny ability actually is and the powers that come with it, something that Kubrick's film never really touched on. And in addition to this, Flanagan also spends plenty of time characterizing both Abra, the girl that Danny connects with who shares his ability to shine, and Rose the Hat, the primary villain of the film, and makes it clear how each of them relates to Danny's trauma and journey to salvation. That being said, by focusing on these smaller character moments, the film does tend to stick to its own slow pace, and it can feel a little bit plotting at times, which might bore some viewers. And alternatively, when the film reaches its third act, which features a lot of callbacks, the film does transition to feeling a little bit like it is retreading some of the ground of Kubrick shining by going like, remember this, and that, and that? However, since all of these callbacks are of iconic moments, and since Dr. Sleep spends a worthwhile two hours doing its own fascinating and creepy thing before we get there, the homages feel welcome and fully earned. Thereby, in the end, all of the elements of Dr. Sleep culminate into a great, if occasionally slow and plotting companion piece to both King's and Kubrick's Shinings that honors both and, in so doing, offers up a great and oftentimes chilling character study that delves into the long-standing damage that can be caused by the horrific events of one's childhood. Acting there is a sizable cast here, but the primary three are Ewan McGregor as the adult Danny Torrance, Kylie Curran as Abra, and Rebecca Ferguson as Rose the Hat. Of these three, Rebecca Ferguson is far and away the best of them. She is seductive, charismatic, and wholly terrifying, usually all at the same time. She delivers a performance that is plain chilling. I honestly put her up alongside Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise for best performance as a horror villain in 2019, for very different reasons, but still, she's spectacular. Following this, Kylie Curran is also good as Abra. She is fun to be around and full of a lot of strength, energy, and charm, and she makes for a great young Padawan type of character. And lastly, Ewan McGregor's Danny is a good lead and helps to ground the entire film. McGregor brings a lot of emotion to Danny's journey, though he is a lot more subtle with his delivery than his two counterparts. I don't think he is as captivating as Ferguson, but for being a character with a lot of deep-seated emotional trauma behind his every action, McGregor delivers the feels. Then, among the more secondary new cast members are Cliff Curtis as Danny's friend Billy, who comes off as a really good guy but doesn't bring too much else, and all of the members of the True Knot, which include Zan McLaren as Crow Daddy, Emily Allen Lind as Snakebite Andy, Selena Ann Dews as Apron Annie, Robert Longstreet as Barry the Chunk, Carol Struken as Grandpa Flick, Catherine Parker as Silent Sari, James Flanagan as Diesel Doug, and Met Clark as Short Eddie all of whom are suitably creepy, but are almost always overshadowed by the superior Rebecca Ferguson as their leader. Additionally, Zachary Momo and Jocelyn Donahue give fine performances as Abra's parents and do enough to make you care about them both, despite not getting that much screen time. And finally, small spoiler here, some of the cast from Kubrick's original Shining were recast for Dr. Sleep, namely the young Danny Torrance, originally played by Danny Lloyd, his mom, Wendy Torrance, originally played by Shelley Duvall, the wise old Dick Holleran, played by the late great Scatman Carruthers, a handful of original ghosts, including the naked bathtub lady in Room 237, and even Jack Torrance himself, originally played by Jack Nicholson. And while the new cast members are clearly not the original actors, the performances given by them are pretty good, and once you get over the fact that the actors on screen in Dr. Sleep are not going to look 100% like their counterparts in The Shining, then it becomes really easy to just see the new cast as the characters they portray. And in some instances, the film even alludes to the fact that some of the recasted characters might not actually be who they resemble. It's fascinatingly well done, and this new cast includes Roger Dale Floyd as the young Danny, Alex Esso as Wendy Torrance, Carl Lumley as Dick Holleran, and Henry Thomas as Jack Torrance. Costumes, hair, and makeup. 
The costume and makeup departments had a bit of a ball recreating some of the costumes from Kubrick's Shining. We get a good look at Wendy Torrance and young Danny Torrance in their classic clothes and touting their original hairstyles, namely Wendy's blue bathrobe and long black hair and Danny's bowl cut. And there are also a lot of other little homages in the mix as well, such as the adult Danny wearing strikingly similar clothes to what his father Jack wore in The Shining, i.e. plaid button-down and overcoat. And, of course, the costume and makeup departments also did marvelous jobs recreating the creepy Overlook ghosts as well, including the creepy twins and the bathtub lady in room 237. And when it comes to new costumes, there are a lot of great ones as well, namely the look of the True Knot members. They all have on various clothes from different small cultures such as Romani and Native American, all mixed with modern ideas. And this style helps to characterize the True Knot members by making them and their actions feel like something out of some traditional, oft-forgotten folktale. It is cool, and I like their looks a lot. All in all, the costumes, hair, and makeup in this film are quite fantastic. Set Design Most notably here are the fantastic Overlook Hotel sets. However, I can't give all the credit to the crew of this film since Kubrick and his team imagined them first back in 1980. However, the crew here did a great job at making these classic sets look worn down and forgotten, starving. Additionally, there are a lot of scenes that feature the True Knots camp, and it is great as well. It looks like a cozy, modern Romani camp, which just added to the zest of the True Knots' already fantastic costumes, hair, and makeup. Their camp is strangely haunting and inviting. For example, the lighting of the camp and the various locations it was set up in seem like something straight out of a cult, which the True Knot kinda is, but it also looks like a place I would love to go and relax in. Get myself a drink and sit down around the fire, swap stories with my friends and family, and yet spooky. I dug it. And while the rest of the new sets are good, some even resembling various sets in Kubrick's Shining, they are comparatively basic. An apartment, a town, a hospice care house, but the Overlook and the True Knot camp are definitely the standouts. Choreography There was only a little bit of actual action in this film, and it typically goes by quickly. There are a few telepathic confrontations in people's minds that are more surreal than anything else. A pretty brutal abduction slash torture scene, a shootout, a handful of small homages to Kubrick's original Shining, but none of these sequences are all that long or elaborate. And while they are handled pretty competently and they all work, the action is definitely not one of Dr. Sleep's main poles. Cinematography There was a lot of great work done here to recreate some of the shots of Kubrick's Shining in fascinating ways. While at times the cinematography is exactly like it was in Kubrick's film, Flanagan put in a lot of work to also make a lot of the classic iconic shots new and fun by flipping them and turning them on their figurative heads. So many times in the third act mostly, the film feels simultaneously like a callback and a reimagining of Kubrick's is Shining, and it works well. And in addition to this, there are a lot of new, oftentimes gorgeous shots of both iconic Shining locations and new ones. This whole film looks great on all fronts. Editing The film can be very slow and drawn out, featuring long takes of some might say dull stuff. Driving, walking, etc. And while some folks might have preferred if some of the scenes underwent a little more trimming, the whole endeavor emulates the pacing of Kubrick's Shining. So Dr. Sleep mirroring that feels very purposeful. All in all, Dr. Sleep is edited together in a methodical manner to keep itself flowing at a deliberately elongated pace. But this works for the film's benefit in multiple ways, including building tension, keeping the film feeling even, and acting as a homage. CGI While there are plenty of practical effects in Dr. Sleep, some stuff needed to be done digitally in post, but it's never abundant, and when CGI is used, it feels natural and looks good. From small character details, such as the piercing eye shine of the True Knot members, to some subtle weather effects like mist, to various telepathic powers, to the visualizations of characters' minds, to expanded sets, the CGI here is clearly present, but it is never overused or invasive. Music The music is very haunting and also very reminiscent of the music from Kubrick's is Shining, but with an occasionally modern twist and it is honestly one of the biggest uniting factors between the two films. For instance, right when I heard the original theme of The Shining play in Doctor Sleep, I got chills of excitement, and I felt like I was right back in that world, and what made it even better was that the placement of the classic theme, and the music in general for that matter, never feels forced. It is always welcoming and fits nicely. <laughs>
direction. Mike Flanagan is an adept horror filmmaker. I have never seen anything that he has done that I haven't enjoyed. He has such a creative and unique voice in the horror genre that just lends itself so easily to the horror worlds created by both Stephen King and Stanley Kubrick. And because of that, Flanagan was able to craft a film that was able to honor both creative geniuses and still feel like a Flanagan film through and through. And this excellence is proven by the fact that both Stephen King and the Kubrick estate have openly praised Dr. Sleep. And just that fact, in and of itself, shows just how much work Flanagan put into the film in order to make it such an exquisite horror ride. My Enjoyment I enjoyed Dr. Sleep quite a lot, so much so that I never felt the film's lengthy two and a half hour runtime. Not only was I chilled to the bone by many of the events on screen, but I struggled to look away from them and oftentimes found myself enthralled with them because of the stupendous performances during them by Ferguson, McGregor, and the rest of the cast. And now that I've seen the final product, I can't wait to do a shining Dr. Sleep double feature whenever I can get my hands on the film because I think the event will be a five hour horror epic to remember. Recommendations If you are a fan of The Shining, either King's or Kubrick's, plus a fan of the Doctor Sleep book and or King's writing in general, this film is going to be right up your alley. Or if you are just a fan of creative and unique horror films in line with Flanagan's previous work, especially The Haunting of Hill House. However, if you aren't all that into slower horror films that can at times feel a little plotting and artsy, then this won't be your cup of tea. But for anyone else who thinks they can push through that fact, Dr. Sleep is a deep, horrific time worth experiencing. Thanks for watching, I hope you liked it. If you did, leave a like. If you want to add anything, feel free to leave a comment. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I'm Professor Kino, and I look forward to our next discussion.